Now, Cal, when you were a young person, did you have any special possessions, something you thought of more dearly? Mm, not really. I'm not much of a sentimental type. Although I think as a boy, having a, my own knife seemed like a kind of a rite of passage to me, especially running around in the jungle when we were in Panama. My mom was pretty legitimately apprehensive in me even using one, let alone having my own, because one of my older brothers still has this huge scar on his hand where he nearly cut his thumb off with one. But it still just seemed like something a guy was supposed to have, and I don't remember the incident deterring me much from wanting one. As I got a little older and began to realize the benefits of subtlety and compromise rather than simply yelling, oh, but I want one to my parents, I hit on an idea that eventually gave way to me owning my own knife, even if it seemed a little lame to me at the time. I got a knife that wasn't just a knife. It seemed to have one of everything inside of it, a Swiss Army knife. Originally adapted from knives used by Swiss soldiers in 1886, there are now hundreds of makes and models of these types of knives designed for specific users. Hunters, handymen, homeowners, computer repairs, etc. Ingeniously designed, they incorporate attachments like scissors, saws, files, fish scalers, pens, pliers, whistles, wire cutters, compasses, lights, tweezers, and even altimeters. Most people are surprised at what they can find inside one to the point that the name Swiss Army Knife has become a metaphor for any ingeniously designed tool that's fairly compact and has multiple uses. Although infinitely more simplistic, the idea of multiple tools coming from the same source can be related to living things in the science of epigenetics, which, if you're not familiar, is the study of the ability for the same source code DNA to express different programming under different environmental conditions. This is known as phenotypic plasticity, where changes in organisms are caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself, and is actually now known to be quite common in creatures. The concept of epigenetics was first introduced in 1942, but the study has grown immensely since the year 2000. It has taught us a great deal about how genetic information that was previously inactive can be brought online, so to speak, without a change in the DNA of the creature involved. The epigenetic code is a set of switches that turn genes on and off in response to environmental stimuli and is a main contributor to the ability of the finished product to vary despite the same DNA instructions and should not be confused with natural life cycle programming such as caterpillars to butterflies or tadpoles to frogs. Scientific experimentation has shown that previously hidden genetic information can be activated under differing environmental conditions. A great example of this is in grasshoppers and locusts. Up to the 1920s, scientists used to classify grasshoppers as a separate species to locusts. The reason was the significant physical and behavioral differences between them. For example, locusts swarm, yet grasshoppers are solitary. Locusts have smaller legs, wings, and bodies, but have larger muscles and a 30% larger brain than grasshoppers. However, because of recent observations, scientists have determined that they're the same creature that can transform from one variant to another and back again under certain conditions, while the DNA of the two creatures remain identical. Similar to how the fictional comic book character, the Incredible Hulk, transforms from mild-mannered scientist Dr. Bruce Banner into the rampaging green monster known as the Hulk under duress, grasshoppers also undergo a transformation under certain laboratory reproducible circumstances and exhibit a sort of Jekyll to Hyde transformation that is truly startling. According to a Scientific American article, serotonin seems to be the spark. In the wild, during droughts, when grass becomes scarcer and more parched as it shrinks, the normally solitary grasshoppers get pushed into smaller areas. As their legs begin bumping into other grasshoppers at a certain point of density, a swarm-inducing serotonin dump gets triggered. 
A transformation results in behavioral differences and significant physical changes in neural, muscular, and exoskeletal expression that allow them to swarm out of the area. So, this transformational ability seems to be an inbuilt survival mechanism that kicks in when the environment demands an adaptation. Similar to how in the popular children's show, transformers can morph from a car, truck, or airplane into a robot and back again, this hidden genetic information is tremendous evidence of design and foresight. Obviously, if grasshoppers in a drought situation did not already have the ability to transform, they would perish before they could ever have evolved it. But what adaptation pressure or survival benefit is there to having an ability you don't yet need? So obvious are these challenges to the story of naturalistic origins that some evolutionists have been speaking about it as if it had a mind that could account for such pre-planning and forethought. Evolution may be more intelligent than we thought, according to researchers. In a new article, the authors make the case that evolution is able to learn from previous experience, which could provide a better explanation of how evolution by natural selection produces such apparently intelligent designs. And such statements reveal that far from being scientific, these ideas are simply imaginations. When we look at the amazing, apparently intelligent designs that evolution produces, it takes some imagination to understand how random variation and selection produce them. Foresight design on the scale we see inside creatures in what many deem the natural world, actually the world God created and then cursed due to man's sin, requires the attribute of omniscience. Just like Swiss cutler Carl Elsener, the clever designer who made the Swiss army knife popular, needed to anticipate the possible needs of his patrons and incorporate multiple utilities for work, survival, into his design, so too did the loving creator God of the Bible, foreseeing the fall, incorporate an incredible amount of genetic information into his creatures that allow them to adapt and survive in a sin-cursed world. All the more confirmation that the beasts, they will teach you, the birds of the heavens, they will tell you. The bushes of the earth and the fish of the sea will declare to you, the hand of the Lord has done this. Job 12, verses 7 to 9. How could a no-mind process, like the story of evolution, account for the pre-planning required for producing genetic information that wasn't yet needed?